right. Where so were we last week when you so rudely interrupted? <laughs> <laughs> we are picking up on verse 11. Okay. On 20 verse 11. And this is the judgment at the great white throne. Right. Um, it's an awesome throne. So the verse says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. I saw a great white throne, great in status, power, and authority, white in purity and holiness, a, and a throne in kingly sovereignty. And him who sat on it, who is this? The Bible tells us that the judge is Jesus. Oh, you're doing your... I'm sitting here and say, what verse is she on? <laughs> no, I know you're getting started. And more likely, the fullness of the triune of God. The earth and the heaven fled away. Earth and heaven flee from this throne, but there was found no place for them. There is absolutely no, no hiding from this throne. No one can escape the judgment that it represents. Many, even most, Bible scholars believe that Christians will never appear before this great white throne. And we've discussed that. <clears throat> it isn't because we can hide from it. No one hides from it. The idea is that we are spared from this awesome throne of judgment because our sins have already been judged in Jesus at the cross. We don't escape God's judgment. We satisfied it with Jesus. However, Christians will have to stand before another throne, the judgment seat of Christ. We find this in 2 Corinthians. Therefore, we pass from these bodies to the world beyond. We must each give account according to what he or she has done, whether good or bad. This describes a judgment of works for us believers. At the judgment seat of Christ, what we have done will be judged. Our motives of what we have done will be judged. Paul presents essentially the same idea in 1 Corinthians, where he speaks of a coming assessment of each one's work before the Lord. In that passage, he makes it clear that we have done what we have done and our motive for doing so. That will all be tested by fire and the purifying fire of God will burn up everything that was not of him. We won't be punished for what was not done rightly unto the Lord. It will simply be burned up and it will be as if we never did those things at all. We will simply be rewarded for what remains. You know, there's going to be people that want to get any crowns. But you know what? But they'll be saved, but they won't get any crowns. I got to talk to Pete, and I said, and part of that talk was, you know, I don't want to be that guy that's in line. And when I come to my turn to stand before Jesus, and I have no crown to give him. Yeah. I said, and I said, what a horrible day that was. Mike Haycock told me, he said, that really spoke to him. Yeah. You know, I, I just can't but imagine you, that. I, I, and I totally agree, and I don't want to be in that position either. But at the same time, part of me sits back and goes, I'm in heaven. I'm good. <laughs> yeah, but, but here's But I but want to be want able to represent and give to Jesus when I go up there. You're going to be adoring him so much that all the other stuff, you're going to want to give him back something. It's like I was telling Mama yeah. last night, and we were laying in bed. We always try to do a little story before we go to bed. <laughs> and my story last night was, uh, well, we had m many last night. We didn't think we were ever going to go to bed. But anyway, uh a preacher asked the congregation or the crowd, he says, how many people in here have read the Bible from the beginning to the end? And he said, no, and he said I mean all the way through. I said, he said, I says, I know there's some tough <laughs> ones. There's Chronicles. He says, when you go through that, and he says, and when you get to the minor prophets, that's like, I don't, they don't, these boys don't have a clue. He said, no, but you're supposed to. Right. 
right. He says, you should read them. He says, now how are you going to feel when you get up to heaven? And St. Peter is going to say, Henry, I'd like you to meet Obadiah. Right. And Obadiah says, how'd you like my little book? And you're not going to be able to answer him. He you said, and you're going to be embarrassed in heaven. <laughs> he said, you need to read them little books. <laughs> I thought that was so cute. <laughs> Henry here is over dying. <laughs> now, also, though, sadly, some will get to heaven. They can, they have done great things for God. That's right. And we'll find out when they're at that judgment seat of Christ that they really did nothing. Yeah. Because their motives won't life. right and their heart won't right. Exactly. Well... Those may not make it to the judgment seat of Christ. No. They may be at the great white throne. You know, it goes along with many will say, the Lord, Lord. Right. But you have to do my will. And you wonder what his will is. Especially for the reward. Yeah. And you wonder to what degree. Yeah. Is it Doing a Sunday school class? No. Or is it picking up the cross or put your life at risk for it? It's walking the walk. It's, 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 it's living day to day for him. Yeah. And in, in the way that you think everything that you read in here that he set a guy he has set a guideline yeah. as far as yeah. the way we're supposed to live our lives. That's exactly right. And if we're doing that then we're doing what he wants us to do. Yeah. But we've got to do it with a pure heart. Right. Well, your words is your everyday walk with Christ. It, it, you, it's not about it's not about singing. It's not about doing a job in the church. It's about your daily walk with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that is what you're going to be judged on. It, loving your neighbor. Mm -hmm. two, the two, what's the two most important commandments? Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And, and two, love your neighbor. Yeah. Each other. Love your neighbor. Yeah. Okay? And that's what that means. Is if you follow those two commandments, you're gonna meet the requirements of Jesus. Well, that's what you're gonna be graded on. That's your works. Right okay. there. And so many people that's been in church forever gets confused about that and I don't understand that. Uh, I mean I've had people at Pena come up to me and says, I don't I don't have a, a gift. I said, Yes you do. He said, what do you mean? I said, you get up every morning and you pray. I said, that's a gift. I said, you're walking for Jesus. That's a gift. That's right. Yeah. That's what you're going to be graded on. It ain't about can you sing in the choir. Yeah. Yes. That's a, you might get a crown <coughs> for that, the service crown. Well, the thing but about it don't is mean. It, it even goes into, it, even though you might be a Sunday school teacher, if you're being a Sunday school teacher just because they ask you to be a Sunday school teacher doesn't mean that you're doing it for the right reason. Same with the choir, doing yeah. any of that stuff. That's why I say you've got to have a pure heart and it's got to be something yeah, that, I agree with that you're wanting to yeah. do for yeah. Christ. Yeah. Not for any kind of glory for yourself. That's well, one of the reasons I so admire street preachers. Well, it reminds me that of that. Heart. I agree with that. I can't remember that old man's name, but he used to be the butcher at the butcher shop in Fremont. Well, How? How Brothers? Yeah, where he, they had the butcher shop up you know, there. The How Brothers. Yeah, yeah. well, I can't, I can't remember his first name, but he used to come in the store I was working at all the time. And every time, it didn't matter what day it was, what was going on, what was happening. He'd come in there and you'd say, hey, how are you doing today? He said, I'm doing great. I'm pick, picking in a green and picking in a green. And he was just as happy all the time. And at that time in my life, I was just mesmerized by this. But he loved the Lord. Yeah. yeah. And it flowed from every fiber of his being. That's right. All the time. When they see that coming out of you, yeah. they're seeing what God is like. But he was always well, I, picking and picking yeah, and, and, and I'm not doing this pat myself on the back. But when you see a neighbor in need, and you don't do something about it, it's, it's this parable that Jesus gave about 
if you see a fellow that needs a coat. Mm -hmm. They said, just don't give me a coat. He said, give it all to him. Yeah. Give him all your clothes, mm -hmm. if that's mm -hmm. what it takes. That's what he's talking about. Yeah. A, a, a neighbor that needs, yeah. you know? Uh, you can be in a neighborhood full of Christians, and I've seen it right here. Mm -hmm. That neighbor, the lawnmower broke. And that's the simple way to put it. Yeah. The grass is getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And you think any of those Christians got up and went over and mowed the grass? Yeah. Uh -uh. I, and I did it for, well, I did it for Annette when, uh, uh, what's his name, got the yeah. motorcycle grass and mowed their grass. I'm not saying me, I'm just saying that as yeah. an example. Uh, and I thank God for it. I have that draw. Yeah. Whenever I see a need, my heart goes out. I yeah. automatically go there and try to figure out a way I can help. You know, It's like Sondra had a hole in her front yard. And it had been there for years. And it could bug me every time I drove by. That hole was there. And she like that. Yeah. She was at work. Nobody was home. I took the tractor and the blade, went over there and graded that thing up. And it's nice and level now. And I didn't, I didn't tell them I did it. I didn't, I, they hadn't spoke to me about it. And I hadn't spoke to him about that about it. But God saw it. That's right. That's what it's about. Yeah. That's looking out for your neighbor. Love likes loving your neighbor. Right. Another case of loving your neighbor is just like we did for sincerity. Sincere. Yeah, sincere. That's loving your neighbor. Yeah. That's loving your neighbor. You know. Oh. Uh, I mean, I'm just speaking of him. He is doing good. That's correct. Cool. He he's. They didn't. He would. They were hoping he was going to end up at the school across the street. But it didn't get approved, and he ended up going to Eastern Lake. But I, it, it's like I was telling the social worker, because I had been asking the social worker about it, and she finally said, you know what, I'm going to call his mama right now. And she called, and, and you know, it went to voicemail. Well, the mom called back. And uh, she said, Tammy's asked about him several times. She said, so I wanted to reach out and see how y'all were doing. And, you know, they're still, they're still struggling, but he has been doing phenomenal in That's school. That's correct. Right. And I think getting the change of the kids that were around him has allowed him to have a fresh start. Sure. Yeah. And yeah. they're not seeing the behaviors and the different things like that. That's wonderful. So, I it was a real positive feedback, and Mom said that she was going to do better at staying in touch with us because she said, and and told Jordan to tell me thank you for asking about him and checking on him and that kind of thing, that it meant a lot, you know. When did you, I, and I probably shouldn't even bring this up because this is going to take up time. When you die, or a person dies, when does judgment happen? Think about it. A Christian, it says, to it's die, to thing. die is to be with Christ. Yeah. Pain, yeah, just like sweet. that. Your body goes in the ground and stays there. Right. And you go. Okay? A sinner, what happens to them? They get held in basically purgatory. They yeah. stay in the grave. They yeah. don't even go to hell. I, I'm, I'm not to prove that to you. They stay in the grave. Their body and their soul is <coughs> in, the, in the grave until judgment. And the dead rise. I know we've yeah. we've ta we've been taught and we've been studying about that if you're evil, you're hell. You go to Hades. You're in a holding place until. Well, Hades can be the grave. Yeah. You see, yeah. You see what I'm saying? So you know, I've often wondered when we judge. I even asked a couple of preachers, and I ain't gonna bring their names up because y'all know. Them. When is the judgment? We keep talking about right. the judgment seat great white throne he's and one of them had the best answer he says a christian judgment it's happened at the cross yeah once you accept that cross and jesus your judgments happened you've already had your judgment there is no more judgment for you he said oh you've got to worry about it i put chills on it you don't have to worry <laughs> about chills, judgment man. there ain't no more judgment for you yeah. and that also that, that, that pure pure chills yeah. up me there is no <laughs> more judgment for you because you You've done it. Jesus yep. did it for you. The only thing you're going to do is go up there for the rewards. That's right. That is so unbelievable awful. Yeah. So you wonder why you don't have eternal life. And you wonder why the rewards. You know? It's like 
Is that an additional motivational thing for Christian? That's why he has a, a way to serve Christ. Yeah. And what yeah, you... I mean, if you do his will, you're serving him. Right. And you go a step above and beyond. You know yourself, you've had Christians that go to church all their life, and they haven't moved forward. They haven't learned. They haven't studied. They haven't matured. Matter of fact, McGee calls it, and I've said it many, many times. You're up there on the milk. Yep. They're not on the meat, and mm-hmm. they've been on meat that milk their whole Christian walk. Yep. Well, that's what we're talking about. You see what I'm saying? So the you Christ- get to the- heaven, Pardon? and you learn all this stuff, and then you go to the millennium, mm-hmm. and you become teachers. That's exactly right. And guides, and witnesses, and preaching and teaching, trying so to convert. It's all on your shoulder. That's what we need to learn here. <laughs> Go ahead, Ted. All right, so we're going to look at 12 and 13. <coughs> and I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each according to his works. So standing before God, this is not a trial. Trying to determine what the facts are. The facts are in. Here is the sentencing of someone already condemned. That's exactly right. Yeah, you're right. Now, That's a good way to look at it. I... I got a question for you. Christians, there are some, are worried saying that you shouldn't be cremated. You should not be cremated. They try to cite some verse that says you shouldn't be, and I ain't found that yet. They need to read verse 13. Mm-hmm. Maybe, man. When you bear the sea, you come up. Where's that body going in the sea? Right. Okay. It says, my, my reference is this. God can create me from dust, mm-hmm. then I can go back to dust, and He still can resurrect me. Well, that's and, my belief right there. And on top of that, sir, so though, therefore, I don't have no problem with cremation. But well, there's, there's ashes and dust to dust. Exactly. Exactly. But here's here's the thing too. If you have any kind of scientific knowledge, the body, even in a casket, it's going to corrode away. Yeah. Yeah, we moved graves in New Britain Church. They dug the graves up, and all they found was dirt. Exactly. So they moved that dirt where the body should be. They boxed that dirt up and put it in another grave because they had to move it because the building was being made. Right. Ain't that something? So. Uh, That's amazing to me. But to justify that by trying to say that, it, it it's even scientifically it's wrong. Right. So. But what I was going to go from this here is some, because this is a sentencing and not a trial, those who stand before the throne have nothing to say. Many think they will tell God a thing or two at that final judgment. As, and, and the reason I'm bringing that up is I come across a Dear Abby letter. And it really made me go, right there is a prime example of that. All right, so it says, Dear Abby, I'm troubled with something a reader wrote. What right do we mortals have to demand an explanation from God? Abby thought the writer has never known the gut-wrenching pain of losing a child. God didn't answer my prayers. And I resent being told that I have no right to question God. Is there a God? And if I ever get to meet him face to face, you can bet your life, I will have plenty of whys for him to answer. I want to know why my little girl died and why that drunk was allowed to go on living. I love her more than my life and I miss her so. I am mad that I am having to live in the world where she no longer lives. And I want to know why. 
Why shouldn't I have the right to ask that of God? Aren't we supposedly created in his image? If so, surely he has a heart and a soul capable of hurting just as I are. Why would he not expect to be questioned if he has anything to do with miracles? I don't fear the Lord, and I don't fear hell either. I know what hell is like. I've already been there since the day my precious daughter was killed. Please sign me a bereaved mother. Of course, there will be no criticism of God on that day. This desperate woman will not only will see not only the righteousness and goodness of God, but she will also see her own sin and rejection of him more clearly than she ever has. One could only pray and hope she comes to understand the Father himself knew the pain she experienced and sent his son to give her hope and redemption. It is a horrific thing that she lost her job. I cannot only imagine what that would have been like. But Jesus, God sent Jesus knowing what he was going to go through. And she wants to ask of his heart and of his faith, exactly. her daughter might have died like that. What did Jesus go through? What did he suffer? Just so she would be able to be saved. And you're sitting here spit, spitting in his face. So I wanted to bring that out because we encounter people like this. You, you're, you're going to encounter. As you go through your daily walk, you are going to encounter people that are hardened well, just like this. The one you, is the most common that you hear. Why would God allow Western North Carolina to be decimated? Right. They're talking about there's 380 people unaccounted for that they can't even find. Yeah. They don't even know where they're at. And, they're, and, the, and the debris piles are so tall and thick, they're starting to burn them. People that's got missing people say, "Look, you might be there and burning my family." All right. You know, and they ask that, "Why did God allow that?" Now you got to remember this. <coughs> you study. <coughs> read up about what the devil can do. And I and I've had my eyes open so many times about what the, he can control the atmosphere. All right. Okay. The only thing he can't do is force you to sin. Because you're a child of God. Right. Now, he can influence sinners yeah. to do even more evil. But he can't do that to Christians. Right. So you, it ain't God. Just because God created and he's in control. Yeah, he's in control. But the devil has impact too. He is the spirit of the air. Right. Remember that. The spirit of the air. And he can do a lot of things. Yeah. Now, he can't come up and say, Brother Paul, you're going to hell. He can't do that. He cannot, he doesn't have that kind of power. You got more power than anybody. Let's look at Western North Carolina. Yeah. It's not that pure. No, it ain't. You look at Asheville, and look at so, so, little Sodom and Gomorrah. It is. I, and then that. you look at all the gambling in the Cherokee Nation. I'm with you, brother. I'm and, and, you, and you ask yourself, well, the lady should know, and they should know the answers in the Bible. Amen. That's right. And that's it. it it's simple as that. And I learned from experience, not every death, there's a reason for it. Amen. That's right. And when my wife died, my first wife died, it, it was times of grief. But a lot of good has come out of that because sure. it taught a lot of people lessons about... Well, and that's the whole reason why I wanted that pointed out. That was a very good letter to Because you. yeah. you're going to encounter these people. That's right. It throughout your daily walk, it, it might not be that extreme. But I'm on the same page Paul is. Though. But everything happens for a reason. Right. And you it, don't learn from what. Okay. You well, no. Right. What is the worst state in the union for homosexuality? Well, California. Yeah. Okay. Where is the bomb cyclone at right now? And this is not the first one. 
Remember it rained out there for almost 40 days? Right. Mudslides and destroying all that? They got another one. Right. Where homosexuality is prevalent. California and Oregon and... Yeah. Yeah, it's terrible. Washington State is real bad. Okay? Why is it happening there? Why, like he said, Western North Carolina? Right. Okay? I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Well, and that, that was my whole point, is that, it, you know... Everything happens for a reason. That's right. He has a bigger plan in place than just Susie. And the reality of it is, we don't know his plan. We don't know what it was. But it could have been something as simple as he was trying to keep Susie from going through a more horrific fate later. That's right. Or... It could have been Susie might have been going to lead his people astray. I'm going to tell you what, there's a verse in the Bible, and you've heard people, well, he died so young. Why, would, why did God take him, or why did God allow him to die? It says in the Bible, sometimes God will take people out of this world to keep them way away from worse evil later. Right. That's mm -hmm. in the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. I believe or it that. could yep. be. That's in that, the Bible. I believe it too. I believe it too. Their death could bring somebody closer to God. Also. Right. It can be on the positive. There, there's it's a lot of negative. different, and that's my point, is that we don't know what his plan that's was. That's right. We don't know what he was protecting her from or keeping her from doing. Mm -hmm. We don't know. Yeah. But we... As Christians, know we trust his plan. Yeah, that's right. right. Well, I, I'm going to tell you something. When you hear of somebody that's passed away and you're praying for comfort or family, part of that prayer should be, and Lord, use this to open the eyes of the family members that are saved that there is eternity. Right. And that needs to be part of our prayer. Oh, yeah. For them to open their eyes. Use this, Lord, as a salvation moment. Well, that's just like some of, and I know funerals are a somber thing, but some of the best funerals I've ever gone to is a Christian. Is a Christian one that had an altar call at the end. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Because if you're standing up there as a preacher, and you're talking about this one going home, and you, you have the prime opportunity right there to call a sinner forward a non-believer forward yeah. and have them saved right. you don't know right then that might be that that finite moment yeah. that somebody gets saved yeah. so you know that, that was the whole purpose of bringing in that Dear Abby letter in there so. It was an opportune time because we are talking about death and judgment. Mm -hmm. And this is the time to talk about that kind of stuff. That's right. Really well, if you listen closely, you will always hear the footsteps of Satan. Oh, for sure. He's here following you, watching yeah, he you. Is. And he you is. can hear He's sitting spirit. in here right now watching us. Yeah. yeah. And listening to what we got to say. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Shoot. But you know what? Your mom and I talked about it. And I don't know if I believe that Satan is in here. Well, well, well you, that's a whole different story. <laughs> There's no point in bringing that in right now. Yeah. Uh, I haven't lost my train of thought. <laughs> you were talking. Yeah, I forget it. Go on. Okay. And, <laughs> the dead, and, and the dead were judged according to their works. If people are not listed in the book of life, then each one is judged according to his works. Those who refuse to come by God, by faith, to God by faith, by by default, be will be judged and condemned by their works. So, the, there are degrees of punishment for unbelievers, and we were talking about this yesterday on the telephone. According to their works, here is where they are sentenced to a specific eternal punishment and to provide some clarification because like I said him and I were having this and mama we were having this discussion yesterday on the phone there is many people out there 
especially if you are a teacher, preacher, anybody that is leading a flock, and you cause that flock to stumble, you will be judged twice as hard as a non-believer. Absolutely. Because you are leading his people astray. Absolutely. And a lot of people don't realize that. If you're out there and you're taking the stance of being a, a teacher, a preacher, a leader, uh, any of that, you have a, you've got a heavy cross that you are bearing. Yeah, and you don't take that position lightly. And you don't do it half-heartedly. Nope. You don't go into it nope. with, I'm just going to rush to get through this. And we see that. We see it in the pulpit more times than we should. But unfortunately, that's what got me in trouble. Guess what? They are going to get judged twice as hard, and their punishment will be more severe than a non-believer. That's right. That's in. That's in many things that got you in trouble. Oh, I know. That that got me in trouble right there. So, no. I, but you can. So and I told them they were wrong. And if people don't believe it, read Matthew eleven twenty two yeah, twenty. Okay through 24 That's right. and he tells you Plain there are right. degrees of punishment sure. and if you lead people astray especially God's people you will be punished twice as hard yeah. the false prophets yeah. yep so now we're going to look at 14 and 15 this is the death and, uh, and Hades are cast into the lake of fire so then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire this is the second death and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The last echoes of sin are now eliminated. Death is the result of sin, and it is gone. Hades is the result of death, and it is gone. The last vestiges of sin, unlawful domination, are done away with. The lake of fire, when a person refers to hell, the lake of fire is what they usually have in mind. The Bible uses three main words to describe where the ungodly man or the ungodly may go when they die. Sheol is a Hebrew word with the idea of a place of the dead. It has no direct reference to either torment or eternal happiness. The idea of Sheol is often accurately expressed as the grave. Hades is a Greek word to describe the world beyond. In the Bible, it is generally the same idea as Sheol. Revelation 9.1 speaks of the bottomless pit. This place called the uh, Abios or Abyssos is a prison for certain demons. We see it in Luke, Peter, and Jude. I've seen it. The, uh, I've seen it. Or, or more generally, it is considered part of the realm of the dead which is in Romans 10. Which is all reference in Hades. Yep. How, many, how many places is this in? No, no, it's all, when you're saying all that, it's still Hades. It's still, it's still Hades. It's just they're using different, different language. Words, different language. How about G E H E N N N I? I was just that's fixing that, to talk about that's that. Gina. Okay. Gina. Gina. That's the fires of Gina. Now, I've told this story before in here. Jesus reference the fires of Gena, that they will experience the fires of Gena. I can't remember what Gena, it's a Greek word borrowed from the Hebrew language. In Mark 9, 43-44, Jesus speaks of Gena. That's why I said it. Hell is a Greek translation of the Hebrew Valley of Hinnom. And this is why. Right a, a place outside of Jerusalem's Where walls. Where burned the children. Desecrated by Moloch Worship and human sacrifice. And Paul, you talk about sacrificing the children, the Moloch. The reason the wailing, uh, gnashing of teeth, yeah. is because at the Gina, Gina is a dump, right. and Gina didn't burn. It burns continuously, yep. day in, day night, for years and years and years. And it's a dump. It's on fire outside the city. Had festering worms. Yeah, and they would take and the kids had a little pad that went into. It. I'll probably start crying now. And they take the kids, and the kids would be screaming from the fire, and they took sharp sticks and stuck them, and they made them scream even some more, and made them go into the fire. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, that's, you know. 
Well, he did an excellent job. I don't mean to go over that part. <laughs> but that was surreal. That's real. Yeah. That was surreal. How about people? But they're used in, in this form as symbolically, right? Right, for the lake of fire. For the lake of fire. Right. Okay. Yeah. So since we covered that, this is the second death. As there is a second and higher life, there is also a second and deeper death. And after that life, there is no more death. So after that death, there is no more life. The devil and the damned have punish, punishment without pity, misery without mercy, sorrow without succor, crying without comfort, and mischief without measure, torments without end, and past imagination so you our minds can't even begin to process absolutely how horrific that place would be that's right just like just like as a christian you can't begin to fathom how glorious heaven is we only get snippets <coughs> and we have what the bible has told us <coughs> but at the same time we only can start to imagine how great it is. That's right. Same thing with hell. You can only get snippets of how bad it is. So, that is, and the Bible gives us those little bits of snippets for us to learn and kind of keep our eyes focused on it. But at the same time, your human mind could not process how wonderful heaven is. And us that are saved, we know that we get to see that. We get to see that glory. We get to see the beauty and the abounds that heaven brings. I, I wish, my prayer, is that every non-believer would have their eyes open to how horrific hell is. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I I don't want them to know how fabulous heaven is. I want them to focus and have the fear of how terrible hell's going to be. Would be. If they don't reverse it. That's exactly. Right. That's right. I agree with that. So that's all I have for well, today. Well, I was going to say a while ago, when Mama made her point, was we were talking about death, and you were talking about funerals. Typically, what I've seen in Christians, I know it's worked for me and your mama, with all the deaths we had in our family over that 18 month period, we lost what seven people. Yeah. What helped us through that was what our faith. That's right. And I see it more and more and more that <coughs> it seems like when a Christian has lost a loved one, especially if they're going to heaven, they don't have this long drawn out mourning, got no. up to a falling apart type thing. If anything, their countenance, they're almost smiling. I mean, they handle it so much better. And that I think that is, God built that in part, as part of his salvation. It says, look, you're going to have to deal with that, but I'm going to give you this. And you end up almost doing a celebration of life. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You're focused more on their life as it was here, and that they are going to heaven, right. than the woe of the loss you feel. That's right. Yeah. That's all I got. And I don't know where we're at. So yeah, time-wise, we don't need to get into that now. No, no. But I, uh, we talk about what Mama said. She said she didn't believe that the devil was here. As long as you got a functioning mind, the devil's here. Yeah, because, because that's he's influenced and he's working on your thoughts. Okay? Yeah. It may not be so much the devil as you, your humanistic side, is being influenced by the evil forces. And cause you to think thoughts that you shouldn't think. That's right. Like, man, I wish you'd hurry up. I'm hungry. Yeah. I mean, but that's the devil right there. Yeah. Well, I may be a schizophrenic. <laughs> I may be. But I've heard the footsteps of the devil, and I've heard his voice. And I've seen the works of the... I don't believe in ghosts. But I do believe in demonic spirits 
but I have seen a spiritual thing happen with my wife's death. And uh, some people would say, well, it's been a year. Maybe so. I don't know. No, I don't think but, so. But, but it, it happens. And I know the devil exists. I know he exists. But she saw, I saw my aunt leave, saw her spirit leave her body. That's right. And, and it wasn't just her. It was her cousin, too. My and cousin both saw it at the same time. Yeah. Now, and, there, and after that happened, I got curious. And I said, are there any recorded events of this happening? Nurses in the hospital, right. record after record after record after record for the spirit, actually. They see but that's it. not a ghost. No, that's no. the real spirit. That's no, the spirit. And, and see, my aunt was, she was, and they started, we gathered hands and gathered around her. And we were praying. And, and this is the thing. Normally when we pray, first thing I do is tilt my head and close my eyes. Something told me to look up. And when I looked up, me and my cousin's boy caught eyeball to eyeball. And we went and looked at, and when that preacher said amen, her spirit left her body and ascended up. And we both seen it. And it had him so addled, what he couldn't it, even speak. What did it look like, the spirit? It looked like her, but she... Just a form. It, but it was translucent. It was white. A and whisk. She, and, a whisk. And she a went whisk. up. A whisk. Yeah. I saw after my wife died. I was in the <laughs> kitchen. We lived in an apartment in Rona. She died at the hospital. And I always sensed for a while she was present. 45 days. 45 well, to 60 days. I saw in the kitchen a blue transparent like cloud or vapor flowing from the kitchen into her bedroom and out out through the seal outside. I said that's my imagination. Well and then the next day she always said she wanted to be an angel. The next day I saw like a orb Floating, I'm not no sure it was the next day, and then the, the orb, and it had the shape of an angel. The orb did, the wings, the head, mm -hmm. the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I'm schizophrenic or that really occurred, but it, it was in my mind. And I had the devil talk to me one time. I won't go into that because I. I'm too ashamed of it. Yeah. You know? Well. But I, those things exist. Uh, let, me, let me explain something to you. Let me, think about it this way. I'm not going to explain it. Think about it this way. When you and her got married, whether you were a believer or not, in God's eyes, you were one. Right. Okay? And when part, that half, is separate from you, your spirit misses that. Okay? And you have a closeness. Yeah, it's like being familiar. You're familiar with her spirit and my spirit, okay? And when, when that spirit is gone, you've lost familiarity. And your spirit is looking for that connection, and that connection's not there. And therefore, you're going to have feelings of that presence is still there. Your soul, your spirit is still trying to reach out for that half that's missing. I've always believed this. Once you get married and you become one, if you're one in God's eyes, and God says that, you become one. If we're one, then when I pray, I'm praying on her behalf. That's my own personal belief. If I'm one with her, I'm praying for her too. If she's praying, she's praying for me too. The reason being is because we're one. You can't cut a spirit in half. Our spirits have merged together. You lost half of your spirit. And I'll tell you, you feel like you've lost half of your spirit. You do. That's you what I'm feel talking about. feel it inside. Yeah, that's what I'm talking and about. And it just like, something's missing <laughs> for me. And that's right. No, I, I agree with you. With y'all, the closest y'all are, you'll experience it. Well, I know. There's it, no doubt really about it. 
I keep praying that her and I is going to be raptured together. I don't want neither one but of them. But that's what I want the whole family or, or, to have. Or, 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 or we go together. Or we go together. Yeah. You know, I, I've read stories about the wife died and the husband right there with her, and 20 minutes later he passed. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of where I want to be. I, I don't want to stay that's behind. Where I, look at it. I don't want to be left behind. Yeah. Not even. I think I'm left behind because the Lord want to teach me a lot of things. But he wanted to give you time to get right. He wanted you to get, wanted some, get you some time. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. I agree with that. I really do. Yeah. And I feel it. Well, you know, you was like she gave her life up for me. Back when I was drinking and being crazy, I was driving home one night, and I looked over to the right of me out the truck window, and there was a man in a top hat with coattail, black coat and tails, running alongside my truck. Side my truck. So who, you know who I know who that was. Yeah. yeah. I know exactly who it was. Yeah. More or less, he said, keep it up. I'll own it. Yeah, you be mine. Yeah. yeah. And I, I mean, I, that was, I told her about that. Yeah. I did. Yeah. He said, yeah. Then you know what I'm I talking. know exactly what you're talking about. I and sure then, do. And then you say, oh no, I'm, go not, go, I'm not going there. Yeah, yeah. I know it. You don't want to be there. It's yeah. scary. No, we Father, we Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We may be small in number, but Lord God, we love you so much as of much of many. And Heavenly Father, we still might be small in number, but when we study your word, Lord, it feels like the room is full, Lord God, and we know what that is. That's your Holy Spirit that's here with us. And we thank you for that, Lord God. And thank you for the blessings, Lord. I thank you for the group. We thank you for their families. And we ask, Lord, that you keep them all safe and and bless each one and so that the next time we come together we'll be just as happy as we are now. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, that was good explanation.